Okay, so far we have been um, working on chapters 4 and 5, and in chapter 4 we talked about um, how things are characterized as living things, and then how they are classified into different groupings and how they're named. Um, in the last part of chapter 4 we talked about viruses and, and why they're considered non-living and how they use hosts to reproduce. Um, we talked about their lytic and lysogenic cycle. Um, then we moved on to chapter 5. And in chapter 5, we start talking about the six kingdoms of organisms. So if you remember, there are three domains. Um, there's domain bacteria, which has kingdom bacteria in it. There's domain archaea, which has kingdom archaea in it, and then there's domain eukarya, which has four other kingdoms in it. So, so far, we have talked about the prokaryotes, so we've talked about kingdom bacteria and kingdom archaea. And this is just a little chart to kind of help, <laughs> sorry, Charlie is watching um, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse in the background, so you might hear a little bit of tunes and him responding to it. <laughs> He's saying, oh, doodles. Um, <laughs> um, anyhow, so the, the prokaryotes are kingdom bacteria and kingdom archaea, and they have some things in common, uh, but when they were investigated further, so they, they used to be grouped in one kingdom, but when they were investigated further, it was found that they have very different biochemistry and genetic properties. So they were divided and separated into two domains and two kingdoms. So they're in separate domains and separate kingdoms. So kingdom bacteria and archaea include all unicellular organisms. Um, sorry, I should rephrase that. Um, all of kingdom bacteria and archaea are unicellular organisms. They don't include all of the unicellular organisms because we're going to be talking about some of the other unicellular organisms in the rest of this chapter. So um, this chapter, chapter 5, deals with mostly microorganisms, which are mostly unicellular in nature. So they are both unicellular. They're both motile. Um, they both have uh, members that are autotrophs and they both have members that are heterotrophs. So some of them are autotrophs, meaning that they can uh, make their own food, and some of them are heterotrophs, meaning that they have to eat other organisms in order to get their um, energy. So how are they different? If you look on here, they're kind of highlighted, but we said the biggest difference is in, in some of their biochemistry and in their in their DNA, which codes for differences in their cell walls. So the cell walls of bacteria are, um, they have peptidoglycans in them, okay? So there was gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, um, but both of them do have peptidoglycans in their cell wall. It's just a matter of, is their cell wall really thick with peptidoglycan, or is, th like, is there two layers, or is there one layer, um, that sort of thing. Okay, but in Kingdom Archaea, the organisms that are grouped in there have cell walls that are made of special lipids that are capable of withstanding um, really extreme conditions. So we find members of Kingdom Archaea living in really strange um, environments that you wouldn't think that they would, that anything would be able to survive in. So we said there were three groups. There were the methanogens that produce methane. There were the halophiles, which love salt, so they would live where there's really, really, really high concentrations of salt that no other organisms really um, tend to like. And then there's thermoacidophiles, so thermo meaning hot or heat, and then acido meaning acid. They really like places that are hot and acidic, so you find them in um, right near the, the vents at the bottom of the ocean. They're really hot hot vents uh, in volcanoes and things like that. So that, that was the first kingdoms, just a quick recap. 
So now we're going to start talking about those found in um, domain eukarya, so the eukaryotes. And the first one we're going to be talking about are the protists. So we'll do their summary at the end. So, Kingdom Protista. All the organisms in Kingdom Protista are eukaryotes. So we just said they are members of domain eukarya, and that implies they are eukaryotes. So that means they have um, a nucleus in every cell, or pretty well every cell, and they are more complex cells. So they have membrane-bound organelles, they are larger, um, they can do more things. Most of the members in Kingdom Protista are unicellular and motile, so they're moving around everywhere. Um, but there are some that are multicellular, and the ones that are multicellular are the seaweeds. So the seaweeds that we see at the beach, they aren't considered plant-like enough to be considered plants. So they are put into Kingdom Protista because of other features that they have but they would be multicellular. We can actually see them. They're made up of millions of cells. Um, so they're multi multicellular, not unicellular. So why are all these unique organisms grouped together? Um, basically, because they don't really fit into any of the other kingdoms. So they're not animal-like enough to be in kingdom animal, in anim animalia. They're not plant-like enough to be in kingdom plantae. They're not fungus-like enough to be in kingdom fungi. So instead they're all put together in kingdom protista and then they're grouped as animal-like or plant-like or fungus-like um, in the major groupings. So this diagram, um, it's you have it in a small version in your notes but you also have a handout that has it in a large version and if you happen to have lost that handout it has um, diagrams to label on the back but it's also linked from Edmodo and from the class notes page so uh, you can get a bigger version of this because it's it's a really it's a useful study tool if if you think of different ways that you can use it Okay, so right at the top it says why are they grouped together? Basically, again, because they don't really fit into any of the other kingdoms. They're not, they don't have enough of the features to be considered members of those kingdoms. So, we have three major groupings. We have the plant-like, which are often referred to as algae. We have animal-like, which are usually referred to as protozoa. And then we have the fungus-like protists. The plant-like ones are plant-like, so they are photosynthetic autotrophs, meaning, or you could say photoautotrophs. They are able to make their own food using energy from the sun. So they harvest light energy from the sun and they can put it into food stuff. And these are the examples we'll be looking at and they will make a little more sense after we actually um, talk about them a little bit more. Um, so we have three, f these are phyla, phylum names, and if you notice they all end in phyta, and phyta means plant. So these are the plant-like um, protests. Okay, and <coughs> the examples are there to remind you, and you should really know an example from each phylum, but they're to remind you of, of some of the common ones that we'll be talking about. So these are unicellular, and then these would be would include seaweeds. So animal-like protists or protozoa are heterotrophs. Animals are heterotrophs, so it kind of makes sense that the animal-like protists are also heterotrophs, and they are all categorized into phyla based on how they move, their method of locomotion. So you could even write that on here. That would be a really good. Uh, addition to your study tool. So again, these if you're using them as a study tool, dot down other things that will help you when you're studying. The fungus-like protists are like fungi, and fungi are heterotrophs as well, so they have to eat other things in order to get their their energy. 
And these are the three main groups of the fungus-like ones. And if you look, they all end with the same suffix. So they all end in mycota. And mycota means fungus. Okay? So those are a couple of little clues so far to help you remember names. So we're going to take a look at the animal-like ones first, the protozoa. And again, they're grouped there because they have traits that are similar to animals. They're heterotrophic. They, most of them are motile, are able to move on their own, and they lack cell walls. Okay, these are two of the popular representatives that are talked about a lot, and they're two that you should be able to label certain parts for. And we'll take a look, as long as we have time, we'll take a look um, at some slides of them. We've already seen a paramecium. I don't know if you remember that, but in the very first lab, we did that. And Charlie's dancing in the background, singing, so um, hopefully you can still <laughs> hear me. So we have amoeba and paramecium as uh, some of the more popular examples. Again, they are grouped into their phyla um, based on how they move around, so their means of locomotion. So phylo, phylum sarcodina, or the sarcodines, move around using their pseudopods, or their false feet. So that, your example that you should think of is the amoeba. Phylum ciliophora, the first part is kind of the giveaway, so the ciliophora are commonly called ciliates, and basically they move using their cilia. And the example that you can remember is the paramecium. Phylum zoomastigophora, um, they are commonly called the flagellates, so basically they move around using their flagella. And the example that we'll be taking a look at is the trypanosome. And phylum sporozoa, are the sporozoans commonly called. So they produce spores and the spores are able to kind of move around there. They can fl float in the air or be carried by fluids or things like that. So the example of the sporozoan that we're going to look at are um, is the plasmodium. And these last two, a lot of the members of their groups are actually um, um, parasitic. So we're going to take a look, and they have a little more complex life cycles. So we're going to take a look at them and see what kind of illnesses they can cause. No, Charlie, that's too loud. No, no. I can hear it. That's why I said, Mommy can go downstairs, but you said, no, Mommy, stay beside me. Okay. So we're going to take a look at each of them a little closer. The first one. Phylum, sarcodina, phylum sarcodina, the sarcodines, the example we're looking at is the amoeba, okay, um, remember they move around using their false feet or their pseudopods, they basically extend them out and then they fill with cytoplasm and, uh, and the cytoskeleton inside and, and so they would be building cytoskeleton parts in that direction that they're heading and then breaking them down in the parts that are kind of, look like they're following along. Um, they also use their pseudopods to engulf their prey. So if you remember phagocytosis, a way of taking materials inside, they extend their pseudopods out around their food stuff. So we're going to take a look and hopefully you can see this on here. Hopefully it'll work. There we go. So there's over here there's a little bacterium right here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. There's a little bacterium and there so it's extending its pseudopods out around the bacterium. See? And it's going to close over and make a vacuole with the bacterium inside. And then it'll break down the bacterium and get energy from it. See? The bacterium is now moving inside there. I'm wondering, oh, uh oh, something got me. Okay. So it's fairly slow moving, um, and that's how it gets its food by extending its pseudopods out around them, undergoing phagocytosis. Um, 
if you remember when we talked about putting cells into hypertonic and hypotonic solutions, and we talked about some organisms that live in fresh water. If they live in fresh water, that means that they're in a hypotonic solution. So there's more water surrounding them than what's inside of them. Um, in other words, there's more stuff inside of them than what's around them. So the water is always trying to come into them. So remember, animal-like cells don't have a cell wall, and these guys don't have a cell wall. So if they didn't have a way of getting that water out of their their bodies, then they would burst. So amoebas and some of the other protists have these little balers that they call contractile vacuoles. So basically they, they contract or um, kind of squish together to force water out of their bodies so they don't burst. Um, this is just for interest sake. Um, there's special kinds of amoeba called foraminiferans, and they're a marine type that have snail-like shells. They have shell around them for protection, and they're made of calcium carbonate, um, which forms when they die, because they kind of pack together, and that's how the White Cliffs of Dover were formed. And if you, um, you may not remember the White Cliffs of Dover, but there's even a song about the White Cliffs of Dover, um, because of wartime, so that was just a little aside about something for interest. Come here, bud. I'll give you. Do you want me to kiss your finger better? Oh, it's there. Here. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Magic kisses. <laughs> no, darling, not today. <coughs> okay, so the next phylum we're going to look at is phylum ciliophora, and they include the, well, commonly called the ciliates, so they include the paramecium, and their way of getting around is using their cilia, which are around the outside. Um, I think what we'll do is talk about some of the key parts when I talk about each of these, and then um, as you label the diagrams later, it'll, it'll be easier to see some things that they have in common. So, they use their cilia not only to move around, but also in order to sweep food into this little area here, which is called their oral groove. And oral means kind of like mouth area, so their oral groove, so they sweep it down in here, and then at the base it'll form a food vacuole. So then they can take it into them. So kind of cool. They sweep their food in and then they'll form a food vacuole and then be able to break it down whenever it's time. So they also have a contractile vacuole, see, for um, forcing water out. And they have, uh, they're kind of slip shaped like a slipper and they can maintain that shape. And amoeba doesn't. Amoeba are always moving because they're, they're extending their pseudopods, right? But these ones have a fixed shape because of this outer um, coating called the pellicle. And the pellicle is kind of hard, but it's not as hard as a cell wall, so it doesn't prevent them from bursting like a cell wall would, um, but it does help give them more of a, um, a consistent shape. Okay? And they also have two nuclei. They have a great big one, a macronucleus, and a little one, a micronucleus. So that is the basics about the paramecium. So we're going to watch a quick little video there, some of them moving around. So they can move fairly quickly. And then this one, oh, stop. This one is just comparing flagella and cilia. Chlamydomonas are a type of green algae we'll talk about after. Can you see the flagella? You can see them moving around. Thank you. 
kind of see it every so often in these ones too. See the oral groove right here. Oop. Many proteins also use their cilia to create currents for feeding, carrying nearby organisms close enough to be eaten. There. Okay, so the other two phyla that were listed when we uh, first listed the four four phyla and how they move are the zoomastigenas. So the, they're commonly called flagellates, and they move using their flagella. So they'll have one or more flagella. This is showing a, a trypanosome. Um, and then we have phylum sporozoa, or the sporozoans, and they produce spores at some point. So the spores can be carried by fluids or other cells, and they can be moved um, to other parts that are are actually found within their life cycle where they end up traveling. So these two groups, we're looking at a representative of each um, and basically what you should know about them is what type of insect carries them um, and then what kind of, what is the name of the disease that they cause. So the trypanosome, which is a flagellate, you can see it here, it has the flagella. The trypanosome is carried by the tsetse fly. Um, tsetse flies are found in Africa. So if you are traveling to Africa, then you should be careful that you don't get bitten by a tsetse fly because it may be carrying the trypanosome. And the trypanosome um, has a complex life cycle. It spends part of its time in the tsetse fly and then it can bite a human and infect them. And then if it's a tsetse fly that doesn't have it, bites that human, then they can also pick it up and then take it to someone else. Okay, so they have part of their life cycle is in the tsetse fly and part of it is in the human. And, or it also can affect animals, certain animals. Um, but it causes African sleeping sickness. So basically, it causes a person to become drowsy during the daytime or at odd times. They'll fall asleep often. Um, and then sometimes they'll even have nightmares and be up all night. Um, so it really affects their sleeping patterns, but it can also gradually and eventually um, disrupt their nervous system and cause them to go into a coma. So it can be very... Uh, scary illness. So that is African sleeping sickness. And so again, it's caused by the trypanosome, which is a protist. And that protist can be carried by the tsetse fly, and it can infect humans and some other animals, causing African sleeping sickness. The sporozoan, plasmodium, is carried by mosquito and it causes malaria. So again if you're traveling to areas that that are known to have malaria then you would notice that they have um, they would a lot of people would use mosquito nets especially at night time because that's when the mosquitoes will tend to be able to get you easier so they'd sleep under a mosquito net and that helps to prevent them from getting malaria. And so 
malaria causes um, it's a blood infection and so the the mosquito bites a human and then that human would become infected and then if another mosquito bites that human they can pick it up and carry it to another person so it causes um, it causes kind of cycles of flu symptoms and can can be um, can get a lot worse than just flu symptoms but each time they they hatch new uh, plasmodiums then it causes a new cycle of um, flu symptoms so that is the plasmodium it causes malaria and it's carried by the mosquito protists animal like ones now so we covered the animal like protists some representatives of the phyla now we're going to talk about the plant-like ones, which are all often referred to as algae. Now algae can include more than just protists. We've talked earlier about the blue-green algae, and that was a type of bacteria. So algae are plant-like um, unicellular organisms that are found in plankton, and that's kind of, um, it's almost like a blanket of, of unicellular organisms that are floating along the top of bodies of water like the ocean and they will provide um, food stuff for bigger fish and um, other organisms other aquatic organisms and birds that live nearby too or that, that are floating or that are um, flying over the waters and, and uh, yeah so they they're a really important part of the food chain and so we're going to look at some some of the types of algae that are protists so these are plant-like protists there are unicellular and multicellular types again so the unicellular example that you're going to have to be able to label parts for is the euglena um, multicellular ones, if you can think of the different seaweeds that you see at the beach, then you'll have some examples in your mind. So they are autotrophs, again, so that means they can make their own food. And they have chlorophyll and carry out photosynthesis, like land plants do. So they are plant-like. However, they lack true leaves, roots, stems, and water-conducting tissue that plants have. So we're going to look at some of the phyla that are unicellular, that include unicellular algae. Um, and the first one we'll look at is the euglena. So it's phylum euglenophyta, and they include the euglena. And we'll be looking at um, one in a slide. So they have chloroplasts for photosynthesis, but these ones are uni unique in that they can also hunt for food. Okay, so plants don't usually hunt for food, but these little guys can actually hunt when they need to. So if there's not enough light, they can still get food by hunting and um, taking in other things for food. So they have, right near their fla flagella, right near the base of their flagella, they have, I don't know if you can see my cursor, so maybe I can circle it here right here that is the eye spot and in a lot of drawings it will appear red um, but basically it is sensitive to light and it allows them to be directed towards the light so that they can move towards the light for photosynthesis like the paramecium they have a pellicle around the outside so again it's not as hard as a cell wall so it's not gonna keep them from bursting when the water keeps coming in um, but it does give them more of a defined shape. But they can still kind of change their shape a little bit. And we'll look at a little video here that shows, or actually this picture even shows it. They use their flagella for movement, but they also use uh, what they call euglenoid movement, where they kind of just squish themselves up and then spread themselves out. So I think this one might even show it. Yep, so he squishes himself up and then pushes himself along. Now he's not moving anywhere right now because they have they have it in I'm saying he 
Um, it isn't, because they have it in kind of a jelly that keeps them from moving quickly so that we can actually see them. But that is glenoid movement. Now this one, I think it's just, oh, another glenoid movement. Yep. So they have it slowed down. I'm not really sure why I had both of those there. Anyhow. This would be a whole bunch. Um, you could find them like that in a drop of water in a pond. So they are very plentiful in fresh water. Okay, a couple of other um, phyla of unicellular algae. So we have phylum Chrysophyta, and they're commonly called the golden algae, and they're one of their main members are the diatoms, and they're really cool. So if you look at them, they come in all different shapes and sizes, and they have really, really cool, um, like a translucent appearance because their cell walls, their outer cell walls, are rigid layers of silica, which is like glass. So they're like, like tiny little glass creatures. Um, and they're hard, but they're so tiny that we wouldn't necessarily notice them. Like if you were had them in your fingers, you might not notice them that much. Um, they are actually the most abundant unicellular algae in the oceans. They are hugely important. They're at the bottom of the food chain. They are the primary producer. Um, the dinoflagellates are also up there in numbers, but these ones are, the diatoms are the highest in number, so they're the major, major source of atmospheric oxygen um, as they undergo photosynthesis and make food stuff for things higher on the chain too. Um, they're producing or releasing oxygen. So they're one of the biggest components of plankton out there in the waters. Um, we they're also important for industrial use so people will harvest them and they, they'll use them for a feed stuff for animals but they'll also use them because they're they're so tiny and hard they work really well in polishes and toothpaste as an abrasive to help clean things so that is the diatom now, pyrophyta, pyro, I think pyromaniac is, is someone who is like fire crazy. They, they, they really like playing with fire and it's kind of scary, but pyro means fire. So they are the fire algae and um, their main type within them are the dinoflagellates. So they have flagella obviously from their common name you can tell that um, they are they have protective hard coats of plates cellulose plates here's a, a real picture of one these are just black and white diagrams and they have really different shapes a lot of different shapes and they have two flagella there's one that goes around them and one that's at the end of them so one causes them to spin and the other gives them direction they are also extremely numerous and a um, really important part of plankton. So they're at the bottom of the food chain along with the diatoms. Um, but when they, sometimes their, their numbers get out of control, so when there's way too many of them, we call it an algal bloom, um, whenever there's too many of a certain kind of algae. And whenever there's too much of this one, then it causes what we call the red tides because they appear red and it causes the, the, the tide to appear red. So if you're looking down from like a plane, then you would see the red in the water. Um, now the, the problem with that is that when they are eaten by say mussels or other shellfish, then they can be, it can be toxic to them. Um, but then they can also make people really sick too if they eat those mussels or other things that are, have have taken them in. So when there's an algal bloom, then they tend to have like a, a period of time where you're not supposed to eat the shellfish or other things that would have been obtained from that area. 
because they're toxic at those levels. Okay, the multicellular algae are seaweeds. Okay, and there's three main phyla that we'll look at. So phylum chlorophyta, they all end in phyta. Remember all the algae phyla, if we look back, all end in phyta. So chrysophyta, pyrophyta, chlorophyta, phaophyta, rhodophyta. Phyta means plant, so they're the plant-like algae. Chloro, think chlorophyll because that's what they have in them, makes them appear green, so they are the green algae. So if you think of sea lettuce, sea lettuce is a seaweed that we often find at the beach. It's a free-floating type, so it is actually immobile, um, but it just kind of floats there. There's, so there's some that are mobile and some that are non-mobile. A um, multicellular example would be the sea lettuce, or ulva is its genus. And unicellular types would include the Chlamydomonas, which you saw in the video earlier when they talked about flagella, um, but also the Volvox. And the Volvox is kind of cool because this is actually, if you were to blow it up, see all those little dots? The tiny dots are all single-celled organisms, so single-celled chlorophyta, um, but they live together in a colony, and each of these uh, bigger circles inside are baby colonies so they will eventually go out and form a bigger one like this so they're pretty cool there are a bunch of individuals so there are a bunch of unicellular organisms but they live together in a colony that makes a ball um, the second one phaophyta phylum phaophyta phao refers to brown so they're the brown algae they're non-mobile. They have what's called a hold fast, which attaches them to rocks so that they will be fixed at one end and then be floating. So these are found farther out from the water, but sometimes they wash up on shore and you'll see them. This is a laminaria or kelp. So you see it as a really long, wide brown seaweed that comes in. They're pretty cool. Hi, Darlin. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cute. This is also another example. This is rockweed, or fucus, is its genus name. So laminaria is the long brown one, long wide one, and then fucus is this one. And those little um, sacks that you probably have burst at some point and being at the beach, some of them are air sacks that help that part of the plant to float and be near the sun so they can undergo photosynthesis. But some of them actually hold their gametes. So gametes are their eggs and sperm. So sometimes by bursting those, then maybe you've allowed them to reproduce. <laughs> um, the next phylum we're going to talk about are the rhodophyta. Rhodo, think rhodo red, so red algae. And again, they have a hold fast, so they're non-mobile. Um, and they include some really important industrial types like the Irish moss. This is Irish moss. And we harvest Irish moss, especially in the western parts of the island. Um, they'll go out using a, a horse that drags, uh, almost like looks like a cage almost, that helps to um, harvest or pick up the Irish moss. And there's a whole, like, we could watch a video, it's really interesting how they dry it and then um, the the there's chemicals that are extracted from the Irish moss um, they harvest them to to get these chemicals for agar and also for carrageenan carrageenan is one of the chemicals and carrageenan is used in like ice cream and other creams like moisturizers to make them kind of gel together so it gives them the creaminess so, if you were to go and get some ice cream at the store and you look at the ingredients, then you'll probably see carrageenan as one of them. Pretty neat. So that is the all of the uh, plant-like uh, plant protists, the algae. This diagram, you should be able to label certain parts. Certain parts are common to all of them and so you can check this out on the website at any time to like double check 
if you've gotten them right or not, but these are key things that you should pick out. I don't necessarily expect you to label everything, um, but, but key things that are unique, or sometimes they're shared between them, they all have the same kind of parts. We said earlier that this is the eye spot, so right here, this is the eye spot. Um, you should know the flagellum, which is a little more obvious. Um, this is the nucleus, and this the contractile vacuole. Each of these lives in a hypotonic freshwater environment, so they all have a contractile vacuole. Okay, so if you're looking for them in the diagram, I would make sure they kind of look like that. So they're almost like star-like appearance because they are used to squish the water out. Um, the outer coating on the euglena and the paramecium helps to give it a kind of a more fixed shape. They're still kind of flexible, but overall fixed shape. So that's the pellicle, so you should know the pellicle. And the fact that the outer part on an amoeba, there's no pellicle, so it's just the cell membrane that's on the outer part. Again, like any cell, they have cytoplasm inside. Um, what's different over here? Oh, we have a food vacuole showing up, but there's a food vacuole down here at the base of the oral groove in a paramecium. There's just not one drawn in the euglena, but they would have food vacuoles as well. Okay, so they have food vacuoles in common. Um, the nucleus, so here's the nucleus in the euglena and the nucleus in the amoeba. A macronucleus, remember, and a micronucleus in the paramecium. Um, and of course, how they move, the amoeba uses the pseudopods, so if there's lines pointing to these little extensions, then that would probably be the pseudopods. And the paramecium moves using their cilia. Okay, so that highlights most of the parts. My little fella is doing a fashion show for me. He's finding all these clothes and taking them out to show me. So, um, just to recap, we've already talked about the animal-like protists. So that the main examples were the amoeba and paramecium. Um, the algae or the plant-like protists. These were all the unicellular phyla that we looked at and examples of them to help you remember key things. You might want to put extra little things beside them that made them stand out. So this one, for instance, the diatoms, they're the primary producers. Um, they're the primary ones found in plankton, so they're really important for um, providing food stuff, so photosynthesizing and providing food stuff for other organisms. Janae, honey, I'm recording a lesson, Shh, okay? <laughs> He's, she's laughing because her little brother has her pink flowery jacket on, so it's kind of cute. Um, the pyrophyta, remember fire algae, they're the ones that form the red tides. Uh, but the diatoms are the ones, again, they're the, the, they're the number one in numbers for producers. But they're also um, used as abrasives in toothpaste and polish, that sort of thing. So these are the three types of seaweeds, although there are other unicellular green algae that were also mentioned. Okay, so the Chlamydomonas and the Volvox were examples of unicellular ones. But these ones are the, the multicellular. Remember the Irish moss is the one that's harvested for, um, for carrageenan to make ice cream, that sort of thing, ice so they're important on PEI. So the last group we're going to talk about are the fungus-like protists. Fungus, okay, fungus. so, okay, Janae, please, my cheerleader in the background. So again, they are heterotrophs, and there are three groups that we're going to take a quick look at. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these ones. Um, so, slime waters, uh, slime, sorry, Slime and water molds, fungus-like, reproduce Jenny. by spores like fungi, and or um, their feeding involves extracellular digestion like it would in fungi. So they live on something and eat it as they are, are living on it. Um, they move from place to place to ingest food like protozoa do. Yes, please, just let them have it. Oh, goodness, I'm really sorry. 
sorry about that. Had to go and referee for a minute. Um, okay, so they moved to, from place to place to ingest their food like some protozoa do. Um, they're heterotrophic, like fungi and other protozoa. And they have cellulose in their cell walls, like plants. So it's kind of a unique combination in them. Because fungi actually have chitin in their cell walls. So they're not, they're kind of in between. But they're a little more fungus-like than others, so they're grouped with the fungus. Other types of molds, so like the main kinds of molds, like bread molds and mold that forms on your fruit that and vegetables, those would be true fungus. And we'll talk about them in the next section or the next video. Um, but these molds, slime molds and water molds, I had toast, Janae. You can make your own toast, okay? No, I want to make you something for lunch. You can make something for lunch. I would love for you to make me some lunch. Okay. You can make me something for lunch. That would be lovely. It's not lunchtime, no. No. I'll tell you when it is. As she stomps off. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, these are the th three phyla of um, fungus-like protists. We have phylum uomycata, which are the water molds. Um, they include blights, um, rusts, mildews. They're filamentous, mostly saprotrophs, so that means they um, feed off of decaying things but some are parasites. So they would live off of something while it's still alive, um, but not really help it and often do harm to it. So like a potato blight. They extend their little fungus-like threads into the host and release enzymes and digest them. So an example would be um, Phytophthora, which causes tomato and potato crops to rot. And this one in particular was the main cause of the Irish potato famine in the 1840s, where 30% of the population either died or em emigrated. So they left Ireland. The second group, phylum Myxomycota, include the plasmodial slime molds. Um, so they, if you were to look at them, here's some pictures over here, they're slug-like organisms that kind of creep over damp, decaying plant material in the forests and fields. So that's when they kind of are like a plasmodium, like a streaming blob of cytoplasm that has many nuclei and no cell walls. They develop spore-bearing structures that resemble the sporangia that we'll talk about when we talk about fungi and so they release spores when conditions are unfavorable. So that's when they are like a fungus. These ones up here feed like a fungus in that they put enzymes out, they have extracellular digestion. Okay, but the second group, um, they produce reproduce using spores during unfavorable conditions. So that is like a fungus. The third phylum, Acrasiomycota, are the cellular slime molds. Um, they're individual amoeboid cells with one nucleus. Like protozoa, they feed by ingesting tiny bacteria or yeast cells, but they're like fungi in that when food becomes scarce, um, they can produce sporangia and spores. So the last two groups are fungus-like and put into this group because of the spores they produce when conditions are unfavorable. The first group um, is like fungi in how they feed through extracellular digestion. And they are made up of filaments that kind of embed into whatever they're on. And that is it for... Um, that's it for Kingdom Protista. So the last video will cover Kingdom Fungi. But before we do, I just wanted to go back to this diagram. So again, the fungus-like protists, there's three main groups. 
the uomicata, which are the water molds. They're the ones that kind of feed like other fungi with extracellular digestion. They put stick their filaments into whatever they're living on and eat them. Myxomycota and acrasiomycota are the ones that uh, are fungus-like in that they produce using spores when conditions are unfavorable. Okay, so that's it for Kingdom Protista.